Good afternoon, good evening. I am Eric Sharayev, and we continue studying international relations. We have uh, covered lots of uh, interesting subjects already, important ones, uh, and uh, we discussed international law, we discussed uh, international political economy. Uh, earlier, it was uh, international security. Today, and in two other lectures, we will discuss the evolving threats to the world threats uh, and solutions, approaches to address those threats. And so today, let's discuss the evolving, uh, several evolving threats, new threats to international security, plenty of them, plenty of them. And understand, we, we can also mention about uh, violence, we can mention climate change, we can mention the virus, COVID-19, but there's a human rights violations. Is it a threat to national security, a threat to lives of people, diseases? Of course, of course, they are important subjects, but we will be doing this in due time. Today, we'll focus on, on uh, aspects of the national security, which refer to uh, armed struggle, to arms, uh, and individuals who use those arms, violence in the national scale. And uh, to do that, I will use two examples. One is international terrorism, and second, cybersecurity. But those of you who specialize in computer science, a little bit disappointing because we discuss psychological warfare and ideological warfare by the means of, of uh, technology, computer technology. But mostly focus will be on uh, those evolving threats. Of course, it's a, it's a brief discussion, brief analysis, more detailed discussion you will certainly find in, in the chapter which addresses this uh, topics uh, in, in a more detailed way and the more examples there, of course, but now I'll important, you mentioned in important highlights. As always, I will share a screen and we begin uh, to study, uh, to study uh, international relations uh, and the subject, terrorism and evolving security challenges. Well, if you remember, and you should remember, in a uh, recent past, in the previous lecture on security, we talked about uh, different views of security, and national security, and those views were based on, on how people understood warfare, armed struggle. Uh, and for centuries, your and my ancestors were dealing with the conventional warfare, warfare, and so, well, the line and column, and then aircraft, and then tanks, and movements of troops. Well, for centuries, that was, that was the, the issue in the military academies uh, and uh, uh, historians and political scientists and ordinary citizens who were drafted to serve in the military. Well, they were acting, doing things, fighting, defending based on uh, ideas and thoughts in the heads of people in power and politics, also uh, military commanders, conventional warfare. Uh, warfare. Then, then uh, came a nuclear warfare. 1945 changed, uh, changed uh, security issues forever, forever. Weapons of mass destruction, destruction. Of course, of course, most of them are banned, but nuclear weapons are not. In several countries possess those nuclear weapons. And it, it's changed people's perception of security policies. Massive retaliation uh, or nuclear shields or uh, other threats. Uh, referring basically to containment, so all the most politicians, if not all, understand that the use and any use of nuclear weapons is deadly, could be deadly. They understand that the use of those deadly, uh, not using those deadly weapons, just keeping them serves as a threat to others or well, as, as uh, normally say, uh, people in power, it's a, a deterrence. So we make sure that they were not attacked because they know that uh, if we attacked, we will be attacking them, so deterrence. Unfortunately, when we study international relations further and you study further, today there are numerous attempts of, the, uh, uh, of uh, uh, people in the military in, in several countries, Russia in particular, uh, China, is to, to uh, uh, put a more emphasis on tactical nuclear weapons, so limited nuclear strikes, not the devastating attack against big cities, but nuclear. But this is a different subject for a different uh, class to, uh, to discuss. But more and more often, uh, at the end of 19th century, uh, 20th century, past century, 20th century, and today, uh, we discuss, uh, more and more often discuss, asymmetrical warfare, 
uh, in which uh, actions of uh, other side are not really, really symmetrical to action of, of, uh, of uh, one side. In other words, in other words, uh, in a conventional warfare, country A fights against country B, or they threaten each other, and they see what each country does, what, what they do. So we attack here, we attack there. We build our defenses here, we build them, them here. Asymmetrical warfare uh, is, uh, well, changing the logic. Uh, because the attacks uh, coming from groups that you can identify, you can find, you can even know who they were and uh, how many were there, whether they were there. And uh, then cyber warfare, which happens in the virtual space, which uh, is identifiable, their centers and their communications and their database uh, centers and cables, but still the means and, and the targets and the content of cyber warfare is what, what is new, it is not known to our uh, ancestors. Well, terrorism uh, is one of the forms of, uh, of asymmetrical warfare. It's a random violence conducted by non-state actors, such as individuals or groups, against governments or their citizens to achieve political political goals. In many, in many respects, in, in, in many ways, but it's a ma major assumption that terrorism is a form of radicalism, political radicalism acts and ideas intended to produce rapid or dramatic change in the social political order, political radicalism. So not every act of uh, terrorism, not every act of, of radicalism is terrorism, but most acts of terrorism is, is radicalism. What is not radicalism? Well, um, three L's of democracy. So you lobby, you legislate, you litigate. Uh, you legislate, you litigate, you lobby, right? the three L's. Uh, terrorism just dismisses those L's and just say, no, just we hit and hit hard. And that's what we want to achieve uh, by, uh, by, uh, uh, by our actions, a political, political change. Terrorism is different from guerrilla warfare, which is known also for centuries. And well, it became prominent, this, this type of warfare became prominent in the 20th century, particularly with the invention of convenient and deadly weapons. Uh, weapons, not weapons of mass destruction, but weapons that's used in the battlefield. Uh, and, uh, uh, guerrillas usually operate in certain territory uh, and often try to control it to, to identify their uh, political uh, claims. Uh, they're irregular combat units uh, and uh, organized by movements, by parties, and it, well, they seek to seize power, win autonomy usually, uh, found new states. And terrorism is different from piracy. Uh, I'm sometimes uh, asked, well, pirates and terrorists are the same? No, because gangsters and, and pirates, they practice random killing. They, they uh, well, are known for, for um, extorting and kidnapping, but their goal is profit. So it's a material gain. So that's why they are not, not in the category of, of terrorism. Uh, you know that how, how terrorism works, at least you, you've studied this maybe in some other classes, but logic is relatively uh, compelling as to what, what, the, what the goal is. Uh, the act is, is committed. And uh, there's a physical damage, but mostly there's a psychological uh, damage. Not mostly, but could be, could be uh, equally uh, devastating. Physical and psychological damage caused by, by terrorists. But often, often, uh, psychological damage is what they, they seek. They seek. Um, and also, often terrorism is uh, uh, aiming at uh, publicity, self-promotion. Just one act, uh, one movement, uh, move rather, one uh, destruction and everybody's talking about this. So you, you're unknown for, for what you, you have done. And uh, there's a pressure to yield to the demands of terrorists. So they, their comment is that we'll do it again and again, unless you satisfy our demands, either release of prisoners or certain declarations, certain uh, negotiations or something they wanna achieve. Usually it's political, political goal. And if a government say, or organization to satisfy the demands of, of terrorists, well, well, the case is not closed, but at least this issue is, is, is resolved. But often uh, there's a refusal to you, uh, and so governments uh, launch counter-terrorist actions. Uh, and so you, you heard many, many political leaders say, we don't negotiate with terrorists, and we don't satisfy their demands, we, we fight. Them. And the refusal, refusal to yield may cause new attacks. And uh, that's, that's what terrorism is all about. So it, essentially it's a form of political extortion. It's political radicalism, yes, yes, to achieve some 
uh, immediate and, and quick political goals. And second, it's, it's a form of extortion. You do something and so we don't do something. Extortion and racketeering, those of you who go to law school, I study criminal law, know the difference, difference between these two, two forms. Why is it important to, to define terrorism? Just, okay, call it violence and that's it. Call them just uh, disgruntled people. Call them violent disgruntled people. And just why do you have to just split hair, professor, and uh, label terrorism? Uh, it's very important. Very important for at least three reasons. Uh, in the chapter, there's a more detailed description here. I'll just name those three reasons. Why is it important? It's, uh, uh, well, uh, making uh, the government's actions legitimate to address uh, terrorism. To labeling an organization, to labeling individuals as terrorists gives a government, a government, the right to conduct military actions to strike, to strike a man. Uh, this is this is some sort of a, a, a it's a custom in international law, customary law, and also it has been, in, in some ways, was codified, codified. Countries agree that that's, they they have to fight against terrorism, uh, but this is what 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 governments governments do. Mobilization international law. It's if, if countries, governments, several governments agree that that action or that action was a terrorism, uh, they, they can easily uh, coordinate their own legal systems uh, and uh, political system within the countries. So it's more agreement to, to agreement to it. And more often countries can cooperate, uh, coordinate their efforts, uh, act uh, together. And also justification of other policies. Which policies? Domestic policies. Uh, it gives sort of a, a moral boost uh, to government to say, look, uh, maybe we'll act in a gray area here. However, the fact that we have been attacked by terrorism gives us this moral right to retaliate, to retaliate and act. I'm not saying that this is what, this is what, what is supposed to be done, right? This, this can be discussed and whether or not governments have legitimacy uh, or whether there's jurisdiction uh, to act this way or whether or not the customs change in the national politics. But this is, this is important point. Uh, and I always say, Google the term in, in quotation marks. We are not terrorists. And you find many, many, many quotes from different groups because group, political groups usually don't want to be called terrorists because if you label terrorists, terrorist, you know that you, you're in trouble. Uh, and so from legal, political, uh, military and many uh, moral other standpoints. The United States uh, State Department contains official list of uh, uh, international terrorist organizations. If, if you're on the list, uh, if, if, if a group is that, that's just, it, well, spells trouble uh, in so many ways and does a lobbying. Uh, so many groups in the past, which, uh, have, uh, well, are on the list uh, today lobby that that's just we we're done maybe violence was conducted 20 years ago 15 years ago but we evolved please remove us from the from the list of this that's an important issue uh, i uh, always argued that uh, terrorism is not an invention of 21st century even the chapters on international terrorism appeared in textbooks relatively recently relatively recently uh, beginning of the 20th century, uh, some books contain the chapter, then more. Still, uh, many authors uh, just put terrorism in, in a subcategory somewhere, security or uh, stability issues, or even, even, even law enforcement uh, subsections. But, uh, but some, I argue that terrorism has always been part of, uh, of uh, life uh, and part of politics, and it's also uh, well, part of uh, international relations. Terrorism affected diplomacy, affected international relations, it has been. Um, four mm, uh, different uh, types of ideologists would modify, m motivate uh, uh, individuals who would resort to uh, destructive actions. And quickly uh, remind, uh, re remind you about them. Anarchism, uh, nationalism, radical socialism, radical socialism, uh, and then religious fundamentalism, contemporary, contemporary, a development which sparked uh, significant interest in the issue of terrorism in the 21st century. Anarchism, 19th century, especially late 19th century, was uh, a difficult period in many countries, uh, in particular Western U Europe and, and North America. Uh, anarchist groups, uh, small and powerful, uh, usually younger individuals, driven with idea, but uh, I will, will explain this idea. They would just uh, uh, will turn to uh, violent actions. And as one of anarchism leading interpreters, George Woodcock uh, has formulated, 
It is through the wrecks of empires and faiths that anarchists have always seen the glittering towers of their free world arising. So to achieve peace and justice through, uh, through violence. By the way, for those who study political science, it's a classical form of illiberalism, achieving happiness for everybody just by violent means, by violent means. But the, uh, the people were young who were anarchists, but there, uh, there are, the, uh, ideas came from older individuals, usually with beards, and so with a quite a uh, comfortable status of dukes uh, and uh, wealthy, wealthy writers. One of them was Mikhail Bakunin, person of Russian origin, uh, member of nobility. Uh, he's considered to be one of a, one ave on several founding fathers of, of contemporary anarchism. A uh, key idea that any forms of government are evil, any form of government are evil, evil. And government is, every, education is government. Uh, you, you drive on the street that that's government controls. Uh, you take a step and this is regulated by the government. Only free communes or free individuals, small agricultural communities are supposed to be a foundation of free society, when people decide themselves what to plow, what to grow, what to cut, what to burn, and so they live in those small communities. So any form of government is evil, and so the government will not go away, and the only goal is to destroy it. How? We are few and far between. What should we do? We should do the most violent and despicable acts. So we'll scare them, we'll intimidate them, they will not have will to, to to, to fight back, and then we'll, we'll make those changes in the society. Uh, anarchists were striking uh, almost in every country, in, in, in particular, said Europe and in the United States. 1988, uh, Organization of People's Will uh, in, uh, in Russia, they assassinated Emperor Alexander II. The second. For what? He was, he was known as, uh, uh, the, his nickname was the Liberator. He was the one who uh, basically ended serfdom, slavery. In, in Russia, and yet, and yet he was assassinated because he was moving too slow. I'm not kidding. He was moving too slow to liberate Russia, to give political freedom, too slow. And the, the assassination, they thought, they are organized, believe that it will spark uh, immediate uh, revolution in Russia, or at least will serve a lesson to others. So they will listen to people, listen to radicals, and move the country toward well, whatever it is they wanted to, to achieve, they want to achieve a peaceful uh, um, agricultural society of educated peasants where people live in harmony with nature. What's wrong with this? The wrong thing is here. It's the death and destruction associated with their goal. Important lesson of people's will. Just uh, lots of things published about them on the web you can find. That one of the ringleaders uh, was a young woman. Uh, and so when she uh, uh, participated in death of, of Alexander II, she was 27, daughter of a highly ranked official in the government of Russia. Her father once served a governor of St. Petersburg, a capital of Russian empire. Well-educated, wealthy young woman, and yet she turned to violence. So it's a myth that we hear, oh, well, terrorism is just, a, well, uh, attracts only uh, those who are extremely poor, or those who, especially women, who just simply just enticed there by brothers and, and husbands, and that's it, and just women just go there. No, women go there and they become leaders, they become powerful leaders, they bring their ideas. So a 27-year-old person who had everything available for her, she chose the violent path. Just have, see how ideologically brainwashed she was and how, how eager she was to kill others for the sake of her, what, ideas, ideas, ideas kill. Ideas kill. Uh, plenty of other examples. Um, Emile Henry, it's spelled Henry uh, is in English, but it's French name. Uh, he, he, uh, his name is associated with a, with a concept of collective responsibility. He simply just decided to, to commit act of, of a terror in France just by randomly killing individuals. When he was asked, why are you killing randomly individuals who are just, just minding their business? He answer was, there's no random individuals, their own willing taxpayers of an evil government. So they equally share responsibility. So the idea of uh, collective responsibility is very common among modern terrorism, saying, well, innocents, we live in a country and country government is evil, so you deserve to die. Sorry that happened, this is you, you, you are next, but you, you are, see, part of the system and therefore you can die. Collective responsibility, so just give justification to many acts of, of terrorism. Uh, Luigi Luciani, Italian anarchist and nationalist also, gave us the idea, well, sometimes evil acts gave us ideas, but idea of local propaganda of the deed. No matter how 
small and how big your act is, it's still an act. So by doing something destructive, you spark people's fears, imagination. You inspire your brothers and sisters who will also do more acts of, of destruction. Uh, that's international act. The guy came to Geneva. To, it was a convention of, uh, of European leaders uh, to do some damage, but security was, was quite, quite impressive there. And he decided to choose uh, maybe just to uh, you know, attack family members. And uh, uh, Elizabeth of Bavaria, the Empress of Austria, was uh, just a, a random victim of his act. He stabbed her to death, to death. Why? Why she? Why she? How she? Why she was responsible for his trouble? No, he didn't care about uh, anybody. He cared about sending a signal. By killing somebody prominent, he would uh, just uh, uh, gain attention and his organization will attract attention of others. Yes, he was anarchist, also he was nationalist. Nationalist, um, and so awful act in Barcelona in 1893 in in the theater just when a bomb exploded, killing a number of people there. Uh, it's one of the organizers just uh, quote: "I conceived of a plan in which it was possible to terrorize those who believed that they had nothing to fear. To fear, see, one of the weapons of terrorism just people not suspecting, people relaxed, and you strike in the softest place just." And just to, to why? Well, again, to make a statement to promote your your goal. See, one of the one of the uh, things that's uh, screened by Sadi Carnot in France. Uh, one, uh, uh, excuse me, just uh, 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 Cesare Santos. Sadi Carnot was was killed, but uh, the, the terrorist who killed just uh, his uh, words: "Long live the revolution! Long live anarchy!" Basically killing people for the sake of, of these ideas. And the, the, so the anarchists, then came nationalists. I used just one example of uh, assassination in Sarajevo in 1914, the event that sparked World War II. Uh, well, the individuals simply, simply were doing uh, what they thought they had to do, just fighting for the independence of their country, Serbia. Uh, and at that time, uh, portions of Bosnia belonged to Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, Bosnia, uh, historically just a place where thousands and thousands of Serbians live, but uh, they really wanted just have to build a greater Serbia. And one of them, uh, just uh, one of the ideas was to, to, to terrorize the Austrian government, just to push them and to force them to accept independence of, of Serbia. So this is a, well, one of the most infamous events uh, in in world history, just noticeable. It didn't, didn't cause the World War II, as some may think. No, it sparked, just basically pushed the countries to act irresponsibly uh, and act uh, uh, quick, and that's World War I uh, took, uh, took place. Triggered, in this event, triggered World War I. And then uh, comes uh, radical socialism. Uh, I uh, studied uh, radical socialism in the 20th century and should say that, uh, well, this is a controversial term because just uh, socialists don't be don't like to be called radicals, and some prefer to be called communists, others, well, want to be called socialists, others social democrats, saying don't mix me with socialists and, and communists, I'm different. So labels import, labels import. And uh, I'm uh, asked uh, quite often that Professor, well, you put a picture here of Ernesto Che Guevara here, uh, do you believe he killed people? Yes, I do, he killed people, uh, and he was a radical revolutionary. And he is, and I'll tell you right away that as a child, I grew up uh, in a family and I had that's just a little small room and near my bed, there was a big poster of Che Guevara. As a child, five, six, seven, nine year old, I admired this guy, just uh, to me, it was a revolutionary at that time. I didn't know that's what he did. I knew that he was, he was a cool guy. Uh, and the poster was, was there, was there. And one of the reasons why there is a disagreement among many communists, especially in the 20th century, you see, a disagreement about the methods to deliver their uh, ideas. When most communists, say, in the Soviet Union and later on in China, turn to the idea that it must be a peaceful transition. You can't win the hearts and minds of people by killing even, even the few individuals. No, you cannot. Others, like Che Guevara said, no, you can sit and wait, you have to move and act. And if in the process uh, somebody is killed, you kill traitors, you kill, uh, you kill uh, leeches, you kill arrogant, wealthy individuals who don't care about the people of the country, you kill them and build new society. society. It's always a uh, discussion within, within radical groups about how to move, move it in more and more a mainstream way 
or just continue to use violent, violent actions. Uh, realism uh, came to uh, halt, um, not, not as, as a, a, a school of thought, but, but as, as a way to explain international relations. Here, terrorism had a problem, how to explain, uh, explain terrorism. Uh, terrorists don't represent states, they actually fight against states. Uh, they are not visible, they're not come and show just to themselves, look, I, I am a terrorist, I will not throw the bomb. They do it surreptitiously, they lurk in the shadows, attack and, and hide. And how do you, how do you, well, what, how do you, uh, uh, well, identify them and how do you treat them? So, um, and uh, realism is very strong, explaining relations between and among states, but uh, sovereign states, but terrorist groups, that's a problem. And uh, uh, realism is not necessarily uh, uh, really, really eager to deal with ideology, or psychological, religious motivations. They suggest uh, they are important, but not relevant. What's important is security, safety, uh, and national interest. And then, then we can talk about ideology. Here, ideology comes to the forefront. And the individuals will use ideas and kill for the sake of those ideas. Um, so it's, it's important. So realism uh, was, was not really, really ready to explain, explain uh, terrorism. It's still, they, they explain, they understand that so non-state groups use destruction uh, and intimidation. Uh, they disrupt the power balance and, and uh, symmetrical threats. They make the world more chaotic. They make governments disagree. And so, so they disagree, they begin to feud and well, somehow their links are weakened and this is what many terrorist groups actually want to achieve, instability, stability. And so uh, to respond to, to terrorism is to respond to the lack of, of uh, stability. So just, just uh, if countries realize what destroys the stability, they can take care of, uh, of uh, terrorism. And usually it's a violent actions against them. It's the arrests, of course, attacks, uh, uh, some, some form of, form of uh, deprivations or financial, like a story where you economic. And, and so the, it's most, mostly it's a, it's a military uh, violence or legal means also they use, they use right, right there. Liberalism is more, has been more, more ready uh, to explain uh, terrorism. Uh, uh, and, and one of the differences is that liberalism suggests that uh, ideas don't come uh, to people's heads just, just because they, they're just, they come. They must come there for a reason because some, some sort of injustice exists. Chronic injustices, uh, foreign occupation, political corruption in, in a country, uh, profound in inefficiency in addressing problems all those, those political issues cause frustration in the minds of, of individuals and they turn to, uh, to radical groups. Some of them join uh, radical groups and then turn to terrorism. So if, uh, if, if we can address those issues, like political issues, like corruption, injustice, economic injustice, social injustice, uh, uh, ethnic, religious injustice, uh, and if those problems, at least most of them are addressed, we root out the foundation of, uh, of, of terrorism. It's a long process, but bullets are necessary sometimes, shields are necessary, police work is important. So law enforcement is, is playing enormous role here, it's supposed to play. However, uh, it will be just, just uh, superficial. You need to, to, to target the roots of, of the problem. Realists uh, understand this too, but they don't emphasize that. They're saying, yeah, it's important, economic, political difficulties exist, but this is not important, that important to them compared to a, a lib liberal point, point of view. Constructivists uh, agree with both sides, suggesting that it's a disruption of, of, of power balance. Uh, it is uh, confusion, it is fear, intimidation. But when pol pol politicians are fearful and frightened, they, they act uh, irrationally. So uh, constructivism explains terrorism uh, as, as based on three pillars. One is existence of a problem, right? So problem exists. Second, well, people identify somebody responsible for the problem. For example, problem is foreign occupation. Uh, who is responsible for the problem? Well, those soldiers and those officers and the government of a country which send troops to occupy your country. And so, well, the third pillar of violence is the only solution. Even though you and I and uh, most of us understand that the, uh, there are profound problems, and we understand that somebody is responsible for those problems, 
uh, you and I would don't just go and take rocks and weapons and go and fight. No, just we use means which consider to be legal. So I mentioned about three L's, maybe others, petitioning, it's a form of lobbying, voting, voting, again, just the litigating issues. So you, you use peaceful means, peaceful means. And uh, to, achieve, to achieve your goal. Only a small fraction of us turn to violence. And this, this is exactly what terrorism is, is all about. There must be conditions under which some individuals turn to, uh, to, to extreme violence. In the book, uh, you find information about uh, some age uh, and profession, occupation of terrorist uh, studies show that there's no one particular trend. Some people say, oh, must be unemployed, young man, this is what, what is a foundation of terrorism. No, not necessarily. Uh, as I told you, there's a wealthy and quite educated and quite not young uh, men and women join uh, terrorism. Terrorism, and uh, uh, the but there are certain conditions, of course, that that they all share in common. But uh, terrorism doesn't have one particular reason uh, and uh, uh, one particular root. It's, uh, so so many of them. But uh, knowledge of this uh, fact gives uh, us a chance to to address the conflicts. And I use two examples, uh, and you find this in the book too, a Basque conflict. And in no way I suggest that everything has been solved 100%, everything is perfect, A plus, move on. No, but, but the difficult and devastating problem was, which was lingering for many years, uh, well, at least it was, it was approached and somehow addressed in, in the Basque province in, uh, in, in Spain. So there was a problem, policies of the Spanish states, which started under uh, uh, Franco back in 1930s and continued for, for decades. So there's a problem was, uh, it's a, um, people could not uh, fly uh, their own flag, couldn't celebrate the Basque holidays, couldn't speak the language in public places, the name supposed to be given, just, just any name but not Basque name. So uh, that was definitely was a, was a, was a problem. So, well, the government's uh, the regime of Franco was responsible for this. For this, so most people chose to use uh, non-violent means, but some people chose chose violence. Violence. Remember, so the problem exists. There is a uh, somebody who is responsible for the problem. So, government and government officials. And the third, uh, people chose means to address. Some chose extreme means of, of violence. Of violence. Well, however. Uh, a past, uh, well, 15, 20 years, uh, the me economic measures and political measures uh, and investments uh, and uh, agreements, uh, well, were, were reached uh, and, uh, well, the most violent wing of, uh, of, uh, of resistance, so the terrorist wing, uh, declared ceasefire uh, and, so, well, said that we continue our struggle, but probably the goal is total independence. Uh, believe, but but uh, well, the ceasefire has been has been uh, observed, uh, and uh, a group uh, decided to use uh, legal democratic means to achieve achieve its its, its goals, achieve its goals. And if it worked uh, in in Spain and through the political process, education, investments, agreements, compromises, now my humble opinion, it should work in other places. Of course, it's not an automatic copying and pasting. But if something worked uh, and, uh, in a conflict that was lingering for decades, not just 10 years, not just 20 years, just, just more and more on that. So, it, well, principles can be used. Address the problems, address the groups that, uh, uh, well, engage in violence and see how it happens. It, it's happening, of course. It's not easy to achieve, but this principle which I introduced is, is uh, well, supported by constructivist arguments. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, the problem existed there since the Irish War of Independence, 100 years ago, you go, and, and the tensions, cultural, political, social tensions continued in Northern Ireland, which majority of people there, uh, there are Protestants and the minority Catholics. And so, although many or some believe in that Ireland is supposed to be one, uh, and they, some of them uh, will achieve uh, uh, by peaceful means. Uh, for years, for years, uh, 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 Irish Republican Army, IRA, just were using violent means. And uh, even the period was, was named uh, uh, the Troubles from 1968 to 98, when the violence was daily occurrence in the Northern, Northern, Ireland, Northern Ireland. But due to uh, efforts of uh, many politicians in, yeah, the role of Bill Clinton and J.W. Bush, uh, supposed to be mentioned here, uh, they helped uh, to create conditions and find a way 
So that's the Irish Republican Party, uh, Army, excuse me, uh, just turned to uh, to negotiations. And Northern Ireland seems to be a path uh, uh, to peace. Yes, there are tensions, and there are groups which which uh, underline their ethnicity uh, and com contrast them compared to others. So it's uh, non-Irish and Irish, Irish populations in Northern Ireland. However, uh, visit Belfast, it's a beautiful city, uh, peaceful, uh, prosperous, and uh, we believe that uh, that's, uh, uh, these models, like a Basque model or Northern Ireland model, could be used uh, in other places to, to settle conflicts or at least start a process of, of, of settlement. As I put here, the goodwill and patience uh, help resolve conflicts, uh, including one in Northern Ireland. And so, uh, same question I posed, is it possible to, to, to use the same uh, mechanisms to, to address tribal, ethnic, and religious conflicts in any, uh, many parts of the world? It's a difficult question, but at least we should ask those questions and seek solutions, offer them, and try, and try, and try. In conclusion, I mentioned about new uh, form of uh, security threats, uh, which I mentioned earlier, but let me do it, do it again. It's a new and evolving uh, issue. And uh, I call, we call it global information warfare, uh, GIW. It's a global use and management information and communication technology in pursuit of a competitive advantage of, uh, of foreign opponents. Well. Uh, it, uh, global information warfare, it's part of a cyber warfare. It's a deliberate targeting computers and, and networks. So it's uh, cyber weapons can be studied there and this is the, lots of individuals who study political science. If you're familiar with the information technology, computer science, you can find jobs right there in the field of, of defense against cyber warfare. Uh, here, I discuss uh, two forms of uh, global information warfare as a psychological warfare and ideological warfare. They overlap, of course, and there's no distinct, just clear line. This, 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 this is psychology, this is ideology. A psychological warfare is, is mostly about human emotions. It's our cognition, how we think and how we feel and what we do based on our emotions and thoughts. Ideology is about cohesive ideas, way of life, a model of life, uh, uh, principles that you share uh, of, of life, but they, they overlap, overlap. Uh, contemporary uh, information warriors, uh, they use, uh, what they do, they attack reputation of public, public figures, so foreigners, foreigners using, uh, and I show you this, different, different means, uh, they launch those attacks. Uh, well, uh, scorning key political, uh, key policies of country, uh, demonizing certain political views, uh, maybe left wing, right wing, uh, in middle road, but just uh, just uh, choosing them and, and demonizing them, uh, scoring, uh, scoring key political institutions, courts, uh, uh, departments, uh, and uh, other institutions, criticizing international coalitions of the country, uh, insulting selected groups of people within the country, uh, social, racial, ethnic, religious, creating historical myths about the past, uh, just uh, to, to, well, to, again, uh, I'll tell you why is it happening. Uh, designing fake news, to fake news. Well, uh, if, you, if you see uh, those, those me mechanisms or those, those actions, you may ask, why? Why, why is it happening? Just, why, why is it just uh, worth it? The, uh, those who do uh, these attacks, still uh, don't know, uh, don't know. They try to see and, and figure out the results, the results. Uh, in fact, they simply try uh, measuring, looking, studying, uh, studying again uh, to, to measure those effects, impacts, to learn them uh, with sophistication and so with more, more efficiency two years, five years uh, later. For instance, see what's uh, uh, Russian government uh, was doing so far over uh, these years, case in point, using trolls, social bots, fake accounts, using just uh, cyber crime, uh, they were attacking Western liberalism and institutions from a variety of ways, surreptitious ways, uh, creating electoral chaos and confusion. They don't know the outcome of this, but they simply wanted to, to create this, this uh, confusion and to make us be to believe that just everything's horrible, everything's falling apart. Why? 
well, it's better to have a confused adversary than unified, right? It's better to have a disappointed uh, America than, than united and, and happy. It's better to have weakened America than strong uh, and, and prosperous, right? Uh, well, uh, this is the goal of enemy, and, and hopefully Russia is not American enemy in the future, but still so far the assumption has been in Moscow, and therefore this is what they do. Attacking Western policies in history. Why? Well, deliberately, just yes, just to make us weaker, just to, to start arguing, start fighting, to start distrusting each other uh, and silencing each other, just, just and make us weaker. Character attacking Western leaders, regardless who you are and what you do, president, prime minister, just create accounts, uh, 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 well, give account assignments to, to trolls and bots and, and start, start to see what will happen and exaggerating in their uh, differences. Uh, within within countries, at the same time, same time they will just engage in self promotion. So just just presenting the Russian side uh, as uh, as great, as pragmatic. So just we are ideological and they're pragmatic. We are fighting amongst each other. Just they are united. Uh, we have presidents who old and who well not really efficient. Well, their president is efficient. Yes, aging but efficient. Well, uh, well, you uh, learn about Russian history the wrong way, as we give you the right history, just, just, which is glorious, and uh, you learn from us, uh, justification of Russian foreign policy, and support of anti, uh, any, any anti-Western uh, foreign policy, regardless of what it is. Just it's anti-Western, it will be supported, uh, supported there. Like in the time of Cold War, when both countries were engaged in a diplomacy uh, against each other, just anybody who is uh, enemy of your enemy becomes your your friend. Uh, maybe it's unfortunate, but this is this is the reality. And we believe that uh, many forms of competition uh, will be uh, will be located in the coming five, uh, seven, ten years in the cyberspace. It's a struggle for ideas. It's a struggle for hearts and minds of individuals, and not only in in our country or other countries. It's a uh, with uh, countries which, which uh, say, involved in, you know, in the trade and relations with Russia or the US. It's about the whole world. Which model will you choose? Which political system will be better? Uh, which, which lifestyle is supposed to be better? Uh, and uh, the, the uh, outcome of this uh, uh, competition is, is quite, quite, uh, uh, quite an uh, issue to study, uh, to participate, and just to, to uh, make yourself known and visible in this field. I talk about different professional opportunities, defenses, uh, countermeasures, studying, understanding, uh, and so learning. We are taking only only initial steps. Well, this is a brief uh, review of uh, new threats. Definitely, chapter is more inclusive, and uh, I believe just to give you more information. Lecture just to uh, mention important highlights. Uh, next time we will turn to another uh, issue and, and in many ways security challenge, environmental policies. It's more than security, it's about lifestyle, it's about some vision, it's about past, it's about present, it's about jobs, it's about safety, it's about security. So next time we will talk environmental problems and their solutions. So uh, thank you so much for your attention and see you next time. It's Eric Shuraev. Wish you a good day. Thank you.